Thanks for joining us here on 90s Plus. And the race to replace Ken Buck in the 4th Congressional District in Colorado is about to get spicy, I think is the word, with a six-way debate that will air on 9 News on Thursday, May the 30th. And I say spicy because you're going to have frontrunner and current 3rd Congressional District rep and conservative firebrand Lauren Boebert and five challengers, all on a debate stage, which will involve Kyle. We'll get to Kyle in just a second. They're all vying for the Republican nomination and very likely the seat itself. This is a very conservative district, the most conservative in Colorado. The Cook Political Report says it's about 13 percentage points more conservative than the nation as a whole. And moderating our mm -hmm. debate, Kyle Clark. And Kyle, thanks for joining us here. Absolutely, my pleasure. So, Kyle, set the stage before you get on the stage. Sure. Lauren Boebert, five challengers. Is it safe to label Boebert the front runner here? Yeah, I think it's safe to label her the, the front runner in the sense that she has near universal name ID amongst Republicans and she has a tremendous fundraising advantage over the other candidates. And then she's got this quasi incumbency standard. Uh, you know, she's she's a sitting congressperson running in another district because she fled her district because she almost got upset there two years ago and was going to face that same person again this time, uh, stood a decent chance of losing. So she changed districts and, and came to this newer, safer district for Republicans. So yeah, she's the front runner. Um, it means, among other things, that the uh, national Republicans are not coming in to play against her. Uh, mm. They're considering her an incumbent for the purposes of this race. The large field also really works to her advantage because there are going to be people who uh, don't care for Lauren Boebert, want to vote against her, and they've got five other options to split that vote. The nightmare for her would have been a head-to-head -head race. Uh, she doesn't have that. She has a big field, and certainly a lot of political, political observers think that she can cruise hmm. in a big field unless one of the other candidates can really consolidate the non boebert vote. Is it safe to say, similar to what we saw uh, at the GOP assembly in Pueblo, where Boebert took a little over 30% of the vote, where she gets 30% and the other five split get 10, 15% apiece? Is that the case potentially here? I certainly think that could happen. Now, here's what we should note. There has not been any publicly released polling. Hmm. Uh, Boebert's folks have alluded to the idea that she's up in polling. Uh, that's polling that they've seen, that we have not publicly seen, and, and campaign internal polling is not something that we would really rely upon uh, for accuracy. But it's, it stands to reason on its face that she would be a strong front runner. That said, it's also pretty clear from some public opinion polling in Colorado that a lot of Republicans have soured on Lauren Boebert, that they just, they're tired of her shtick, right? You know, um, and that they're looking for an alternative. But... Again, you've got five other options in that race, and are all of the people who are tired of Lauren Boebert's shtick going to stick to somebody else, or are they going to disperse and allow her to walk through, potentially winning just 30% of the vote? Tell us about these five challenges, because we're going to probably get to know them, I would imagine, on May the 30th mm -hmm. here during the debate. Um, any one of them that sticks out, and do you anticipate that they're going to be attacking Boebert because she's the front runner? You know, I think it kind of remains to be seen what that looks like. Some of them clearly want to take on Boebert directly. Some of them want to make more of kind of an oblique, softer case about why they're different. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more policy, less show, you know, less social media theatrics, more, you know, focus on the issues, that kind of thing. Um, so when you look at the five challenge, challengers out there, the least known, least resourced of any of them is, is Peter Yu. Then you've got Mike Lynch, who used to be the minority leader at the State House until it came out that he had concealed a drunk driving arrest from his Republican colleagues and others at the legislature. He ended up stepping down, holding on to his seat in the legislature, but stepping down from leadership, despite the fact that this, this drunk driving arrest and him keeping it quiet came out. He stayed in the in the race for Congress, which some might think is kind of a baffling decision, right? You know, his his political standing within uh, his party kind of collapsed all of a sudden. He's he's still in the race. Then you've got Richard Holtorf, who is another state rep there at the Capitol, probably best known for his chronic case of foot and mouth syndrome. Uh, he has said some pretty astonishing things over the years. Uh, he's compared people with disabilities to those who get injured running with the bulls in Pamplona, Spain. Uh, he told a colleague whose son was killed in the Aurora Theater shooting that he needed to let go of his son's death. He called a colleague of color during a floor debate buckwheat. Um, he, he talked about um, 
a series of women that he's impregnated in his life and how one of them had an abortion and how it was a great thing for her and how he gave her some money and then immediately had to backtrack because he's very anti-abortion to be like, well, I didn't pay for the abortion. I just gave her money after she had the abortion. So, so anytime Richard Holtorf is speaking, you could be in for a wild ride. Um, so uh, he's going he's gonna to be there. You're going to have Jerry Sonnenberg there, who is widely viewed as like the establishment choice in the race. A lot of people thought that Ken Buck timed his retirement in a way that he was trying to get Jerry Sonnenberg the special election nomination to fill out the seat for the rest of the year and give Sonnenberg an edge over the other candidates, kind of like a good old boys thing. That blew up on them because... A number of the candidates, including Lauren Boebert and Deb Flora, who we'll talk about in a moment, said, I'm not going to run for the special election nomination. You all should pick a placeholder instead, somebody who's not vying for the seat on a two-year basis. And that, in fact, is what Republican insiders did. They picked Greg Lopez, long ago the mayor of Parker, more recent gubernatorial candidate. He will stand in the special election, same day, June 5th, to serve out for the rest of the term, while the rest of these uh, six fight it out for the two-year term. And then lastly, uh, you have Deb Flora, a uh, longtime conservative commentator on talk radio and documentarian. Um, and uh, she also, along with Sonnenberg, has some connections within establishment Republican circles. I think the thought would be, just kind of on its face without polling, that Sonnenberg and Flora could be the most serious challengers to a Bobert, but in a field that's so dispersed, who, who knows? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, question from Bobert's strategy point of view. Uh, frankly, I'm a little surprised in a sense that she might be doing this debate because if she is the front runner, uh, both in terms of finances and we saw in the assembly probably seems like she's the front runner as you've been alluding to mm -hmm. what's her incentive to partake in this debate aside from you know obviously it's a good thing for her to do to get out in front of the voters mm -hmm. what's her incentive here that's a really good question um uh, i'll note it'll be the first time that she has taken uh questions in any format from uh, nine news uh face to face since the launch of her first campaign she mm. appeared with us the week that she launched her campaign in an interview that was a little bit baffling from a factual standpoint. And then she has never appeared on our air again answering questions in the time that she's been in Congress. Um, I think one might say that she's doing the debate because she knows she's going to cruise. You know, you could you could say that. Um, you could also say that if she ducks the debate, she gives everybody an easy narrative that she carpet bags into the district, then skips the debate. And it gives people the ability to say she's she's skipping the debate. Um, I also think, you know, skipping a debate doesn't really fit with her persona. Right. Her whole thing is like I take on all challengers, you know, kind of thing. Um, so I think she also might just relish the idea of getting up there and mixing it up with people. Um, she also knows that if she's watched our debates and she's watched our larger debates, that she's going to face some direct questions from us. But there's five other people up there that are also going to face direct questions from us. They're not going to escape scrutiny just because she's the presumed front runner. And a lot of the conversation is going to be among the people on the stage. So if, if she's looking for a way to, you know, spend an hour in the cozy confines of Nine News and only get a couple of direct questions, a six-way debate's a good way to do it. That's a fair point. So there's there's five reasons why she might be doing the debate. Part of the reason I'm asking this is I'm mm -hmm. kind of thinking of a lot of what you said and when you were laying out the kind of different lanes about these different challenges. Uh, it reminded me a fair bit of the Republican presidential um, no nomination contest. Obviously, Donald Trump wins that. And Boebert seems to be almost in a bit of a Trumpian mold. The front runner heading in, kind of that hard 30, 35% perhaps uh, ability to grow it. And I say that the one big difference is that Trump did not debate um, in the Republican presidential contest. Yeah, um, I, mean, I, I know that's. Just yeah, I see what you, I see what you're saying, and she has the Trump endorsement, which she, no doubt she will lord over everybody else in the race, as they would over her if they had the mm -hmm. Trump endorsement, right? Um, she has the Trump endorsement. That's another thing that's that's huge when you look at who is a presumed front runner. She has the endorsement of the Colorado Republican Party, which has dropped its long-standing neutrality rules for primaries, so that the party can endorse its own chairman, Dave Williams, who's running in a different congressional district. But they also have to endorse Lauren and Boebert in, in this race. Um, so I, I think, you know, in, in a way she is, she is the kind of the most Trumpian candidate in the race. There are several others that would probably like to claim that mantle, but they can't 
they can't out Trump Lauren Boebert, right? I mean, you know, and and remember, she got into Congress by promising that she would be more loyal to Trump than Scott Tipton, the sitting congressman who was the co-chair of the Trump campaign in Colorado, and Republicans loved it, and they they put her in office and helped keep her in office. Um, so I think I think you'll hear uh, Trump's name a lot. Uh, from her. I think you'll hear it from some of the other candidates. But there has been a little bit of separation from people like Richard Holtorf, who's a very hard right guy himself, but has said lockstep with Trump is not how Republicans win in Colorado. You know, hmm. Trump friendly candidates in Colorado have gotten smoked in recent years. Um, Boebert is making the calculation that this district is so safely Republican that a full on embrace of everything Trump can't do her any harm. And she's probably right. Um, do you expect lots of fireworks on the stage? I think it'll be. I think it'll be interesting. I, I think it'll be interesting in the sense that um, Bobert likes to mix it up, right? Then you look at the other people up there on the stage. If you're Jerry Sonnenberg and you've got the old guard of the Republican Party behind you, this is an opportunity to kind of lay down and just be like, this is what we stand for. And the performative politics that doesn't really focus on, you know, improving policy or changing America, that's just kind of how many clicks can I get, how many views can I get, you know, that's not his style. But he has an opportunity to say that to her face in this debate. Um, you've got Holtorf up there. Again, roller coaster ride anytime this man opens his mouth. Um, and then you've got Deb Flora, who, with her background in um, talk radio and so forth, is probably going to be a pretty skilled debater. Um, I remember watching her in some U.S. Senate primary debates in which she did not make the ballot, so she was in some big debates at the beginning. She's very well-spoken. Uh, she's very careful in the things that she says, um, which does not necessarily make for interesting television. Um, but just to say, there's a couple people up there that are either wild cards or people who are going to be very comfortable in that format, so I think it'll be interesting to see. Um, and if you're one of the non bober candidates, what are you going to do to change the race? Right? Right? What, uh, something has to happen to change the trajectory of the race. And one of the few things that has ever shown the ability to change a trajectory of a race is a moment in a debate. So, so is that, that what you're watching for, is to see if one of these five challengers can kind of rise to the top here? Yeah, and just, and just see if anybody says anything that's truly memorable or truly seems to stick uh, in terms of a critique of Bobert. I mean, listen... She's been critiqued up, down, and sideways by so many people at the mm -hmm. local level, national level, inside her party, outside her party, and none of it sticks her. It's like Donald Trump, right? You know, I mean, think of like, you know, think of the personal scandals that she's had. Think of, you know, the, the false statements that she's made, the derogatory things that she said about people. And like Trump, it only fuels her brand among the people who like that kind of thing in their politics. So it'll be interesting to see if anybody can come up, come up with something that truly sticks and damages her, or whether this is a night where we see she's at the top of her game there's enough republicans who want that style of politics and she mops the floor with the rest of them anything else we should watch for yeah i just think it, it it'll be interesting because we have not had a primary debate on our air in i believe six years since the 2018 democratic gubernatorial huh. primary that jared polis won um just because the way that colorado dems like to do it is they like to settle their business privately and not have the voters weigh in on it and uh, this will be, you know, uh, the reason that we're doing this debate is because it's a safely Republican seat. So essentially the primary is going to determine uh, who holds a seat and presumably could hold it for life, right? You know, Ken Buck is leaving because Ken Buck wanted to leave Congress. He would have had a really good Republican challenger this year because he had ticked off so many people in the party. But it was his seat to lose because it's such a safe Republican seat. Um, so whoever wins this race could presumably hold the seat for a very long time, uh, assuming that they don't pull a Bobert and make the district more competitive through their behavior, as she did in CD3, and then had to flee. All right, there you have it. Stage is set. Uh, the primary itself is on June 25th, but the, more importantly, the debate will take place on May the 30th, Thursday, May the 30th, between 6 and 7 p.m. Kyle, you'll be moderating it. I'll probably be doing the weather, but Kyle, thanks for joining us here on 90s Plus. Absolutely.